spoke. Hi, Brenda. How are you? This is Sherrard from the Sherrard oh. Show. Hi, Gerard. Yes, this is Sherrard from the Sherrard Show. Sherrard. Um, I'm, I'm, so you came on back. You came on back, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, we're going to start. As my, little niece, my, my little niece is four years old, and she said, I'm on here, man. She didn't say, I'm, I'm on the extension, or here I am. She just said, I'm on here. I'm on here, Nanny. <laughs> so I'm on here, Sherrod. I'm on here. <laughs> well, that's great. We're going we're gonna to start our interview. I'm Sherrod, the host of the Sherrod Show. We have the wonderful Brenda Ager um, on the show today. Um, Brenda, I want to welcome you. And first, see, how is your Tuesday afternoon coming along? My Tuesday afternoon is coming along great. I um uh, I was thinking about it. today is the day, um, but yeah, it's coming on great, honey. And uh, I've had I taught vocals today. Um, I while the COVID is happening, I find myself doing a lot of teaching online. But mm-hmm. I I I love it. I love teaching people and showing people what I know about singing. And and speaking of that, you know, um, I'm telling my audience a little bit about uh, Brenda. You know, she's been in the industry for many, many years. She um, did a couple of duets with the legendary um, Jerry Butler. One of the hits um, that we will be playing during the course of the show is Ain't Understanding Mellow. Um, I love it. You a woman, girl, not to try to hide. You didn't try to hide your love. Uh, close to you and somebody, somebody. Now you wrote all three of those songs. Is that correct, Brenda? Huh? All three of those songs that I listed, like "Ain't Understanding Mellow" and "Close to You," are those songs you've written yourself? No, I did not write those songs. I did write, um, co-write with Prince, "Somebody, Somebody," but the other songs I did not write. Okay, but you. As a matter of fact. Um, you duetted with Jerry Butler, and um, I saw, I, you know, I used to hear those songs all the time as a kid, and you still, they still play them all the time. But how did yeah, you they and do. Jerry link up? I'm sorry? Well, I said, yeah, they do play them. They still play them. Um, Jerry and I met by me writing a song. I've always been a songwriter since I was a kid. And I co-wrote a song called If It's Real What I Feel with Chuck Jackson, who was Jesse mm-hmm. Jackson's little brother. He was from the Carolinas, and he told and Jesse told me, he says, my little brother is coming out, and you like to write songs, and he likes to write songs. I want you guys to get together and start writing some songs. And that's exactly what we did. And we wrote that song, If It's Real What I Feel. Took it, he took it to Jerry Butler. And Jerry liked the song, but he also liked the singer and asked me to come in. And uh, I thought it was a joke because, Jerry Butler and Jerry Butler and Sam Cooke, they were my favorite, favorite singers coming up. So we, well, we, got, sure we enough, got a lot to talk about. It's wonderful you say that because Sam Cooke is my absolute favorite. And I had oh, man, you, having Jerry Butler on the show. And also, um, I just recently, you know, one of my really good friends is Mel Carter as well as Lana Rawl. So I they love Mel. Mm-hmm. They knew very well, Sam Cooke very well. But we're going to talk about them in a moment. But back to your story. So Jerry called yeah. you in. And you so were- I went in his office, mm-hmm. and uh, I was I was thrilled to meet him. And then he, he told me, he says, "Well, I like the song you wrote with uh, Chuck." He said, "But I also love your voice, and would you consider?" And that's exactly what he said. Would you consider recording that song with me? I tried to be so cool. <laughs> I said, well, 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 Mr. Butler, I think that would be a great idea. And all of a sudden, it went, ah. Yes, you don't know how I've loved you. I've loved you since I was in the country. I just went off. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> now, now he said is, um, calm down, calm down. Now, this is in 1971? Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, um, where does that song chart on the um, R&B and also on the uh, rhythm and blues, I mean, on the pop chart? It was our very first record, and it, it, it made it to, like, number four. I don't know, 40 or something in the R&B charts. It, did, it never made the pop chart. That one didn't. It's a great mm-hmm. song. But you know the funny thing about it, Brenda, is back then there were more artists doing duets. Like what you and um, Jerry Butler did, there was so many like Lionel Richie and Diana Ross, 
You know, you had uh, Kenny Rogers and Dolly Part. You had so many more duets. I wonder why these days you really don't see that. I know. I know, man. I know. I love singing duets. I, I just, I really do. I, I love, I like the interaction between two voices, especially when the voices are compatible. Yes. And uh, they sound real good. You know, Kenny Gamble told me um, just a few years ago, he said, of all the women that Jerry sang with, he said, I was the one that was most compatible to his voice and that he liked me best. I'm like, you say that, Kitty Gamble? Oh, my goodness, that's great coming from you. I, I, would, so, agree, yes, I would have but, to agree with that. I would have to agree with that. You're, you're oh, doing so well. thank you. You all sound so thank wonderful. Thank you. I, I love our voices together. In, 2000, yeah. in 2013, I um, did a Jerry Butler um, tribute um, in Chicago. Actually, he had a tribute of, to Jerry Butler in the DuSable Museum. I covered uh-huh. that. And then also I had a, I did an interview the next day with him on a television show. And it just so happened his best friend, Gene Chapman, was there too. So I had them both on the show then. Fascinating in, in, individuals and gentlemen. And it was just so wonderful to have, you know, two icons on the show mm-hmm. who were responsible for some major, major hits in the industry. Don't you agree? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Now, yes, um, I- after, after singing with uh, Jerry, where else did your career go from there? Well, you should ask. Jerry and I came out to do Soul Train, and I had I just fell in love with Chicago. Those that those few days we were here, and I, when I landed in Chica- in California, we had come from a blizzard in Chicago, and landed here. And I'm telling you, man, it's like I literally thought I had landed in heaven. Because the palm trees were swinging left and right, and the limo driver had Bermuda shorts. Now, I've got a coat on. <laughs> he was coming with Bermuda shorts and some flip flops. And I looked around at him, and I looked at Jared. I said, Jerry, I'm moving to California. He said, B, you can't move to California. Your record company is back in Chicago. I said, I don't care. I'm moving to, Ch- to California. And I did. And you know, it's and, so funny um, you say that, Brenda, because uh, I, I love I love what you're saying. Because when I was a kid living in Chicago, I was born and raised in Chicago, and oh, okay. in, in the coldest winters in Chicago, when I used to watch the Bears playing, and when it got dark at four o'clock in Chicago, uh, after the Bears uh-huh. game went off at about three o'clock, I would turn and watch the next football game, and it'd be the Rams or the Chargers. And here it is in uh-huh. Chicago, it'd be minus fifty something degrees. And I'd see all the cheerleaders in Chicago wearing you no know, short sleeve, 80 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. As a six-year-old, I said, where is that place? It must be in another planet. I didn't know where it was. And then I found out, I found out it was here in California. Yeah. I said, I got to be there. I got to be there. I'm sorry. I can't take this. I know. I know, man. And I love Chicago. I love Alabama. I was born in Alabama, Mobile, Alabama. I love it there. And I love Chicago. I love all the places I'm lived and I've actually lived in New York for a little while. But mm-hmm. nothing beats California. I just That love is it. correct. And you know the funny thing about it is that when um um when I was growing up, you know, um all the movies were filmed out here. So I fell in love with Chicago yeah. watching the Rockford Files, watching Chips. Oh me too, that's one of my favorite shows of Rockford Files. Oh my goodness, I was watching I mean seeing Jim Rockford going through the canyons and driving and stuff and the chips and all that. I, I lost my mind. So I said I had to be at this place and then the cake taker the cake taker Brenda was when I you see the Rose Bowl. It was January seventh, oh, yeah. Rose Bowl. And you see the girls jumping up, you know, with no short sleeve and stuff and I had ice on my windows in Chicago. So I, I we're on the same page, Brenda. And that's yes. in California to me. <laughs> Thank God. Yes, my goodness, I, I love this place. I I just give thanks when I'm driving. Sometimes I just is like, and I've been here about forty years. I keep and I still say, "Oh my God, I live in California." <laughs> I, I live in California. Amen. After all these years, please speak it. Boy, I tell you, we're we're cut from the same stock. So now I know. So now after so, um, you know living in Chicago for a while. Um, where else did your music career take you um, once you um, were in Chicago making hits? Oh, well, when I came out here, I, I really jumped up into my songwriting um, because being out in California, one of the things out here you, you, that you do lose is your ability to work uh, because most of the work 
that we do the soul music is on, on the East Coast or, or in the South. So there weren't many gigs out here to do. And I just that's when I started really, really doing songwriting and and um and doing session work. And um I, and then to, uh, Peter Long who Peter Long was a guy who was um a major D at the uh, Apollo Theater. Mm-hmm. And he moved out here. Quincy Jones moved him out here. And since he knew me from the Apollo, he asked me would I come in and write uh, and uh, teach songwriting for Quincy Jones workshop. Mm-hmm. So that's what I, I started um, a workshop for Quincy way, way, way back. And um, mm-hmm. turned out some good writers and, and uh, learned more about songwriting myself. So, um, and then I eventually developed my own band where we we go out and, and we did a lot of uh, um we would eventually go back east to do some gigs back there but mostly the west coast or going out of the country and start doing stuff like that and then i did oh man and all those years I've, I've had songs recorded by um the bottom one my was one of my crazy brother friends and um, him and Shirley Brown um, recorded one of my songs. I, I, I met uh, Billy Osborne, which I'd known for a, a while from LTD, the Jeffrey's brother. Him and I started writing songs together. And uh, Bobby Womack uh, and Shirley Brown, woman to woman, that's Shirley Brown, they, uh, they recorded a song of ours called uh, Ain't Nothing Like the Lover We Got. Mm-hmm. You probably can find that on YouTube, too. But right. just started writing and teaching and writing and singing, all those things. Then I wrote a play. I mean, I've done so much, man. You could call me a Jamaican. I had so many jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but, I but, you, know, you, did it, you. you did it because your passion was so great, I'm sure. Yes. It just was bubbling over. I did it because I had to. I did it because I still have to. Until I drop dead, I'm going to be this enthusiastic. This passion about passionate about what I do, and um, and it has led me to this day. Uh, um, I put up several plays. Um, so what was the play? Cast, um, what was well, I had a called play. Called, I had a play called Let's God, Let God Be God, and it's a really really uh, cool play about two girls. Uh, one, they're both from the from Alabama in the country. But one went to the city and got married, and the other one went to the city and became a prostitute. And I was just living two the two dichotomies of just opposite but best friends. And it tells their journey about uh, through the it's kind of kind of taken off from my life. And uh, but um, the other girl is a made up. She's an, a made up person, but she encompasses. All the 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 attributes of someone who's gone off the deep end and just to re-enter and finding herself, and it's a, it's a beautiful story. And, and I wrote the music and and, and we put it up um, to sold out crowds, but, but I just ran out of money and couldn't keep it up. But um, you know things like and then I did a one woman play um, called Grace, and that was definitely based on my life. Um, and I have another several things. I have another one called "If If We Don't Tell It, It Won't Be Told," and that's a, from a historical point of uh, four women uh, who tells the story of of black, you know, their plight. Well, it's actually three black women and one white woman, but they're all southern, and it's all funny. It's really funny. Wow. Now, um, um, it, it's amazing. Um, some of the things you've done. Um with your songwriting, as you mentioned, as well as your plays. You also were a backup singer for Ray Charles. Um, the stage for a minute, I was a, I was a duet with Ray. I never did go out on the, on the road to sing backup. I, uh, Billy and I wrote a song called Strong, Strong Everlasting Love. So I was in the studio with him doing duets, and we did about four, and, and, and um, they're still in the can, as a matter of fact. Uh, but uh, it was great working with him. He just he just loved him and sing, so I would come out and do duets with him. But um, they're in the can, and hopefully someday, uh, if the people are smart, they'll release them. Definitely. 
really good. He had me to re-record, um, you are my sunshine. And uh, he would be so tickled in the studio because a lot of times it would only be him and me recording in the studio. He'd tell everybody else to, be, to, to lean, and he could work, them, work the boards as well as anybody else. So we would be, have a great time in that singing and making records. Wow. Wow. <laughs> now, um, who was the most fascinating person you've ever worked with, would you say? The most fascinating person? Everybody has Fasc- somebody that sticks out in their mind, you know, that you work with. Others were great, but this person just stuck to your mind. Who would you say it was? Well, if you say fascinating, I would say Diana Ross because I worked with Diana for about a year almost. And she is the constant performer. She, she's, I just love her. She's incredible. When she walks on that stage, no matter what's happening backstage, when that curtain opens, she's there for that audience. And it's just one of, I just said, I would, when I wasn't singing, I would just be watching her. It's like, my goodness, this, this woman, she knows all the tricks of the trade. She knows how to get that audience and have them in the palm of her hand. You know, it's just, and, and, and she never, I never heard her lose her voice. And, and it's, I just love her. I just love everything about her. She's, she's colorful, and, uh, and, and I love the sound of her voice. She sounds like nobody else. And, uh, yeah, and she, she's just fascinating. Yeah. Now, now, you've also worked with Stevie Wonder. You've worked with... Um, love Stevie. Yeah, love Stevie. I, I, uh, I sang with Stevie when I was 21 years old, just for a couple of shows. And I just, I, I'll never forget doing backgrounds on Science Field Delivered. Wow. What was, so, what was that so memorable? Huh, that was at, where was that at? You said, you said you'll never forget. So I'm asking you, why would you say it was so memorable? Oh, it was because it was my, okay, it was my very first, like, real, real, real professional gig. Um, the, uh, the, there was four of us girls that Jesse Jackson, we started in Operation Fred Baskin. That was the um, economic arm of SCLC that Dr. King hired Reverend Jackson to head up in Chicago. You probably know about Operation Fred Baskin, which later became Operation Push. Correct. But he, he started doing the Black Expo in, in Chicago at the Chicago Stockyard. Big old stage and arena. And we, we girls, we four, the four of us girls, and the movie is about two of us uh, um, girls, but we would um, sing with a lot of the people who come in and didn't have that background in singers and everything. And so Stevie came in and he needed us to sing with him for the EXO. And it was our first, like, major, major star, star gig. And we sang with Stevie. And... Um, and the next thing we did, we were we singing with Roberta Flack, traveling on the road with her. Our first, first real, real on the road gig. How, how did you like being on the road? Yeah. Oh man, I got a taste of the road. I was like, ah, this is the, this is the life for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, how long did you stay on the road, um, Brenda? When you well, were- I've been on the road my whole my whole life, but with Roberta, uh. I didn't stay long because Jerry Butler came up. See, while I was on the road with Roberta, Chuck and I were still were writing songs. And then when he took that song to Jerry, my career took off with Jerry Butler, and I was traveling around the world with Jerry. But um, I think the first, well, the first road trips, were, of course, were, was Jesse, uh, but that was more political, although we were singing, but we were helping to get black mayors elected for the first time in D.C. and, 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 and in New Jersey and in, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, and in Indianapolis. We were right there on that stage when it was a victory uh, march, when I was helping to get those, get those guys elected for the first time. So uh, I've been on the road probably since I was 20, 21, 21. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now still you doing, um, still now, um, it's very interesting because you've even worked with Gladys Knight, Shirley Brown, yep. as well as Prince. Now, I'm going to ask you more about um, Gladys Knight first. What was it like working with Gladys? Well, you know, Gladys sent me word that she, one of her singers could not make a gig 
and she says, I don't know why she calls me old lady, she's older than me, but she says, tell, uh, she told her musical director, tell that old lady that she'll come out and have some fun with me on the road. And then, so I said, yeah, I'm not going to turn down the gig with Gladys. So um, I went on the road and, and, and we had such fun. I, I wasn't there long. And, uh, but we would get up in the morning and walk. She could walk faster than me. But we'd do our morning hikes and just have a really good time. I had a good time with Gladys. Uh, and then I came on back. Whenever I come off the road with anybody, I come right back to songwriting because I I love it. It's such a part of me. When I'm not singing, I'm writing. Now, you've also um, worked with Prince. Now, what, what capacity did you work with the iconic Prince? Just as a, as a songwriter, this is how this story goes. Um, I had sent um, – Prince was recording Mavis Staples, and if you ever get a chance, listen to that album. It's a wonderful album. Oh, it's a great album. Uh, but um, I had sent her some songs because, I, you know, songwriters always hustle to get their songs recorded. And I sent her some songs, and, and she did not record them because Prince was finished with his, his album, with her album. And um, he usually don't take other people's music uh, material anyway. So about a year later, after her album was done, she called me and she was whispering. And she said, Prince, did Mavis, uh, girl, uh, Prince, she called him Prince. <laughs> girl, Prince, is in his office. And he's reading your lyric, girl. He said, he said, Mavis? Uh, that Brenda Lee Anger, I, 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 I get me in touch with her because I think she's one of the best lyricists I've come across in a long time. So she said, I'm calling you for him, and he wants you to send him more lyrics. Don't send him the music. He doesn't want your music. He wants to put music to your lyrics. And so that's what I did. I sent him a bunch of lyrics, a bunch of songs, and um, she took um, somebody, somebody, and wrote, and um put his music to it, and it became a double platinum record. And then he called to say, I'm just going to see if you approve of that made one change in your lyrics and see if you if you approve of it. I'm like, man, you could have, I don't care what you did to it. I don't care. As long as you, are you kidding? But I thought it was really cool of him to ask my opinion on the song. Uh, and then um, we just, yeah, it was incredible. It's incredible. And I, and now, I look at it when I... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, my when I think about it... When you think yeah. about it and, and, and reflect on it, how do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? Oh, my goodness. It's, it's, like, it's like moving to California. I feel like, wow, this, this guy actually... It's, and when I saw him on, oh, my God, when I saw him on TV singing the song, you know I went crazy, don't you? Well, I you know I'm sure I did. I'm sure you did. <laughs> yeah. Wow. He was, on the, he was on Rosie O'Donnell's show and debuting Somebody, Somebody. And to, to see my words come out of his mouth was, to, to me, I look at the video every now and then right now and just say, my God. He's actually saying, and it took me 20 minutes to write that song uh, it, because it was all true. It was raining, and I was lonesome, and I just, bam, 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 the words just came out. And uh, and it was a double platinum record, and, and I'm really happy about that. Wow, that's very, very good stuff. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking to um, Brenda Ager. I met you, and for those who just tuned in, she's a songwriter. She's a singer. She's an actress. She um, also writes plays. And have done so much in the industry. And one thing you can definitely take away, she loved, like me, being out in Southern California. I'm um, sure that's a wonderful thing. Now, Brenda, you've also um, uh, sang and done a musical alongside Della Reese. Is that correct? That's another thing, yeah. I, I, man, I can forget it. I'm glad you got it. I'm glad. <laughs> but, yeah, I, Della cast me in one of her, her first play was called uh, The Message and the Music. And uh, we did that maybe about almost 20 years ago. But this past year, my singing um, partner in the play, my well, my best friend, which the movie is about, she also is a great writer, uh, a playwright. So she wrote um, 
I saw a, a play about Della. And we went to Harris in New Jersey last year and put that play up. And I wrote the music. She wrote the play, and I wrote the music. And that's also a, a really nice play. But I, I I learned a lot. We both learned, all of us learned a lot from Della. Della, we were under her, her wings for quite a while. Wow. Now, um, let's change gears for a minute or two. Um, let's kind of talk about Soul Sisters Official. Now, um, did, all of did things, you see it? Oh my goodness! And um, I was very moved to see Jesse Jackson, to see um, all of the different people that you know is being a part of this and the history. You know, the yeah. fact of uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, what that was all about. Now, um, with the Black Lives Matter and all of the tragedies that have happened just this past month and a month before, and in history, um, during mm-hmm. the Civil Rights Movement, what was it like for you back then in the sixties? It was exciting to be on the front line, not and 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 my naivety. All of, all of us, we were so naive at 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 the um, meetings or, or in the marches. You know, we didn't we didn't think about that this was dangerous. We didn't we, we just wanted to make a difference, and we were young enough to not to not get caught up in the fear of it but just wanted to make a change. And and so we would go into, like, getting people elected. Say, for instance, um, Perrin Mitchell in Baltimore, Jesse would take um, out of Operation Brink. I think we had a 21-piece band, and we had a 100-piece choir. Well, Jesse took us four girls, myself, Patty Henley, Sue Conway, and Dolores Scott, and he named us the Piper Rest of Freedom, to sing with the band whatever city we went to. And we would go into these cities like Baltimore, and we'd go in maybe three, four days early and start singing, singing in the mornings on flatbed trucks, in the parks, on churches, on top of buses. It didn't matter. The band would play and the girls would sing. And after that, for about an hour, Jess would speak, and then we'd take to the streets, and we would march and arm in arm in the streets with the, with the people of of, of uh, Baltimore, and then we'd go to door to door and and knocking on the door, and some people just didn't want to wake up, just didn't want to come out. But I would knock on, the, on all of us. We would say, "Look, my name is Brenda Lee Yeager, and I'm from Chicago with Reverend Jackson, and we've come here to help you get your mayor elected for the first time. First time a black man is going to be um, elected." And surely, if I come from Chicago, you can come out and go vote. And we were adamant about that. And those people came out in, in, in all those cities. Every time you see a black mayor or a congressman back at the end, we were part of that. And those people came out, and we won every city, every city we went to. And then sometimes at the, at the bread basket meeting, oh, my God, there were, there were two gangs, well, there were more. There was Panthers. But there were the Blackstone Rangers. I don't know if you know about these. Oh, I do. Okay. And 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 a couple of other gangs. And Hell, Rookings were one of them too. Yeah. Well, sometimes they would all show up at the meeting, Shira, mm-hmm. and it would be a nervous time for the grown people. And and I remember one time that the Peastone Rangers and uh, Jeff Fort and somebody. else, um, well, the Panthers were Panthers with me were pretty cool, but there were times that the Panthers would be there and, they, and the Peace Stone Rangers would be there, and they would all be in the same room, man. And you could feel the friction, you could feel the the intensity. And uh, I remember one time that they had lined the wall of the of the um, theater, just like just surrounded the wall, and. Um, Tensions were high, and then Jesse called on me to sing, We Are Our Heavenly Father's Children. And, you know, by the time I sang the song, they had sat down on the floor, and it was it was like music. And that's what, what this movie is about, how music can soothe anybody, almost anybody. And we that's why he had the people, to, had us to go and sing before the rallies, Sing before we march, and march while we sing, 
because there's something about the vibration and the frequency of music that is very spiritual, that is very uh, um, bringing people together no matter what. If you hum a certain frequency and hum a certain tune, Now, now, Brenda, I want to ask you a question, a couple of things. Now, um, yeah. during the 60s, um, the spirit of the movement with the civil rights movement and what we're going through now with the Black Lives Matter, is there a difference uh-huh. in the spirit or the spirit feels the same as it did in the 60s as it does now? Well, I think the spirit, the spirit is there. I think the spirit is there um, like it was back then, but what's different about it, I think now, I think it, it, it's encompassing more people. We used to have, you know, a lot of black people, some white people, but now we got a whole, the whole world is watching. The whole world wants to get involved. And I think it's a better time for our kids to really learn what the movement back there did to, in order to enhance the movement here today. Where I think it's a better time for us to teach our young whose shoulders they stand upon. Because a lot of times they don't know, but they're beginning. I think they're beginning to see. And what we're hoping this movie does is to show them whose shoulders they're standing in, show on, and show them what we did back there, and what makes it so important that we continue to 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 look after ourselves, to to protect ourselves, to honor ourselves, to honor ourselves, to honor ourselves. Because now the thing, you know, the thing that's very interesting is that. Um, you know, I wasn't around in the 60s. I was a 70s baby. But, you know, I did a uh-huh. and reading on um, the 60s. And, you know, oftentimes I asked my dad, was the 60s as tumultuous as it appears? For example, in 1963, the murder of John F. Kennedy. 1964, the murder of, of uh, Sam Cooke. 1965, yeah. you had Malcolm X. And then 1967, mm-hmm. um, you had... Um, 68, Dr. King. Yes. Dr. King got Back in '67, you had um, the um, passing of Old Freddie, and but then oh, in '68, yes. the you also had the uh, murder of RFK. So with all those, and I'm sure I'm missing some, quite a few others. Did it did it seem like was it as tumultuous living in times as it does appear in the history books? Yeah, it was dark. The history books don't really tell it. They don't tell it. That's why we have to tell it. They don't. They they they're missing out a lot. And, and they, they're not they're not bringing to us all of the truth first of all, and then the, the, the psychological and, and uh, uh, fact of what this does to a, a human being not uh, not to mention a black human being that that we're living in a country to where the, you perpetuate fear and 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 and, and bigotry and unfairness. We needed to. We need. We need to. They need to know what this was like, and um, and uh, and we. They need to know that the, the improvements that they have made. Our young people. They, I, I honor our young people because they may not know their history, but by us doing what we did back then, they've got a platform where they can actually do what they do. It's 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 awesome. Uh, but they did, some of them still need to know their history because it would give them such a sense of of, of belonging and, and, and our culture and how rich and wonderful it is, you know. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing because, as you were mentioning, and just as your documentary is showing, you know, in the 60s especially, music, every every situation and circumstance that you had gone through, it was a song. That was like a theme song for it. For yeah, example, yeah. Curtis May Curtis Mayfield had many songs that yes, that yes. sang for the times, that sang to the times, yes. and it was, yes, it was right. fascinating. Even in the seventies as well. And then we can't forget a change gonna come by Sam Cooke. I mean, That's that was right. the theme song for the civil rights movement. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yes, Timeless. Right. So, and and I love that you're doing that because this this Soul Sister official, uh, Soul Sisters official documentary is so amazing and powerful because young people need to sit down and see what we went through and yes. where we're going yes. because of the yes. wise man who ever lived said either you're going to learn from history 
or you're doomed to repeat it. Oh, you're doomed to repeat it. That's right. And that's it's right. Amazing. And we want it's amazing what, we want what you're doing them. in terms yeah, of that. Yeah, thank so you. I commend yeah. you, and I love I love it. Now, let's just um, change to a lighter note and topic and topic okay. for a moment. Um, like I said, I, I'll tell you a brief, quick little story. My mom okay. was a diehard, love him to death, Sam Cooke fan. She actually Ooh. had all his album. She um, went to his concerts. And she even went to the funeral in Chicago. He had two funerals. No, um, she, she did. Went, she went to the one in Chicago that had about 10,000 people there. And it was minus, I think it was minus 40 degrees that day. That, but they, everybody was standing outside to see him. Uh, his body and wow. stuff at AR, AR Leak. And then they had the funeral in Los Angeles. Um, and that was um, at um, the um, it was brother's funeral home. That's where it was. And they said it was an unusually chilly day in L.A. And it was even raining. That's how that's how it was. But um, my point is that, you know, my mom was always impressing upon me, Sam Cook. But I didn't really get into him until um, towards the end of her, of her life, like in, in 99. She passed away in 2001. And now oh. interviewing some of the most fascinating people who've known him, I really can slap myself for not um not oh my God. earlier because I, he's an amazing individual. Amazing individual. He was amazing. I was 10 years old when I first heard um, You Send Me. Darling, you <laughs> send me. <laughs> You send, you send, you, baby, send me, honest you do. <laughs> yeah, I was 10 years old when I heard that. Wow. Well, did you ever meet Sam Cook? No, I mean, I didn't. I met all the people around him, but he was gone. He died in 65, and I was still in high school. Principal, okay. I was still in high school. Yes, I was in the eleventh grade. I remember our, our principal. I was walking down the hall in the eleventh grade, and our principal came over the speaker, loudspeaker, and he said, "Ladies and gentlemen, I have sad news." He said, "The great Sam Cook was murdered last night." Oh my God! I Screams went out all over the school. All the girls were screaming. The guys were crying. We were too, it was pandemonium, and uh, we had we had heard that before. When, when uh, and same thing when uh, John F. Kennedy was was murdered. We, I was walking down the hall. And, so, um, but I never. Get, but I did get to meet um, some people, and of course, Bob Womack and I became friends um, years and years later. Okay, we got a lot to talk about now, Brenda. Let, let, let's 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 jump right into it now. A couple of things. Now, um, you have to you have to listen to my interview with Lana Rawls, who was uh, Lou Rawls' widow, his wife. Okay. And Sam, okay. And Sam, and Sam Cook was um, Lou Rawls' best friend, so Sam would come to yes. the house. They knew him extremely well, so she goes uh-huh. into detail. She goes into detail the night he was murdered, because uh, he really was at, he was at the house. Um, and he was, um, you know, he was playing with his godson, which is Lou Jr. And Lou was, uh-huh. um, Lou, Lou Jr. was crying hysterically. And Sam, and nobody knew why, but they found out later, you know, it was death on Sam. That's why um, he was crying hysterically because babies can sense that. Babies and uh, animals, they say, can sense. They can so, sense it, yeah, of course. Yeah, so Sam was, um, you know, Lou was going to go out with Sam, but Lana tells me that they had, they were going to be in Redonda Beach the next morning, so they had to get up early, so they let Sam go on, um, and he oh. went on out, and, um, you know, uh, Lana was saying that, you know, at about midnight after um, they were on their way home, she was wondering what, where was Sam, you know, what was he up to, mm. and Lou said, oh, he's, you know, he's probably out having a good time um, at one of the bars or whatever, but the, she said she got a call at about three in the morning while they were sleeping, and Lou Rawls' mom had called and said Sam had been murdered. So oh. they are, and, she, and she was screaming hysterically and everything. So everybody met over at Sam's house. Um, you know, it was everybody over there. And, um, oh my and um, God. Barbara um, was p- playing the music so loud, and everybody was crying and everything. It was a, it was such a thing. But I don't want to give it all away. I want you to listen to that. Or, um, it's one of the most fascinating. How do I listen to it? Can you send it to? How do I listen to you? I would send it to you. I it just came out. Love. Today. 
it just came oh, out. Oh, I would so, love to hear it. Yeah, um, but it's it. She was so close to him, and and she tells us some very deep inside stuff that you know that didn't happen the way you know you read books about him being in a um, uh, um trashy motel with a prostitute. It never happened that way. So you have to. Right, I know. Way. I know. You know, I, I wrote a. I have a play called uh, "I'm in Love with a Dead Man," and it's my. It's my. Um, it's about if it's two people play myself as a character, and then somebody to play Sam. But uh, it's a good play. It's a good play, then. Uh, mm-hmm. And I wrote a song called "My Dear Mr. Cook." I could write a book on how you make me feel. And then it goes on. And, yeah. Yeah, man, wow. I'm telling you, when I say I'm a Sam Cooke fan, I go to play about him. Here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 what about um, Bobby Womack? Because Bobby Womack had a whole – he knew Sam very well, actually. he was. Um, oh, he knew, he knew him very well. He was, his, he was his guitarist, and he was in and, – and Sam signed him up to his label, actually. Yeah, and yeah. The and, Valentinos. And, yeah, the Valentinos, that's right. And uh, three months three months after Sam died, he married Barbara. Correct. And he caught a lot of hell for that. He actually got beat up by his brothers because of that. Yeah, he said they beat the crap out of him. And right. but he said he said he said you know uh, he knew that was you know not really cool. But you know when you're young, you do things that you wouldn't do when you get older. That is correct. Now did he um now did he have um did he speak much about it with you with Sam and all those things that happened? Um no not 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 about the murder or anything we just be talking, he'll say a story about Sam or, or something like that tell him mm-hmm. once upon a time there was you know we did this and we did that but we didn't really go into stories in detail. Mhm mhm yeah Bobby was just something else he's very talented guitarist great singer as well yeah. He had a, and my dad always say he had he can he can holler on tune. He was the only singer that can holler. Oh, he's sure good. He's sure <laughs> good. <laughs> wow, he's sure good. My... Now, Brenda, have you ever thought about writing and putting your life in an autobiography? It's so fascinating. You, well, you know that is so funny. You should ask. Just yesterday, you're the second person. Yesterday, someone a, a publisher uh, asked me to write my story. So we need that book on you. We need to know everything about you now. Mm-hmm. And so I have a publisher already. I just got to get started on the book. And thank mm-hmm. you for reiterating that to me. And, and you're another, you're just another uh, validation that I've got to do this. What, what, it's a capsule. See, it's a capsule. See, that's one thing. So this interview is a capsule so that when you're long gone, I'm long gone, people can see this interview and, and, and yeah. capture what they didn't live through but what you live yeah. through. So that's why, yeah. you know, what, the, the point of my, what I do on, my, on the Sherrod show so often, um, Brenda, is I interview legends that, you know, um, may not be as popular as they once were, but they have a story to tell. And once they're dead and gone, that story goes with them. So at least I want to get that story from them. That's so right. So that you can, it'll always be alive in somebody else's that's eyes. That's right. That's and, right, honey. And one of my favorite um, guests on the show is Mel Carter. He was actually Sam, my, pursued, Sam pursued him and signed him to his label and wrote a song for him and the song was when a boy falls in love. Now Mel oh, and and sound and hold me, hold me, never let me go until you told me, told me. I love Mel Carter as a young girl and I, every time I see him, I just. You just don't know how much I was in love with you. And he just falls out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you, and you have to listen to our interview with him. I, my interview with him, I did a week before um, Lana, like about uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I was sitting next to you okay. as well. And he actually Please, oh, fun. man. You know, I love stories. I love people's stories. I love to tell stories, but I like to listen to people's stories because they're fascinating. And you know what? Black people have got stories to tell that's never been told. We've got mm-hmm. to tell our stories so people will understand and know who we are, not mm-hmm. their interpretation of who we are, but who mm-hmm. we really are. Mm-hmm. And I, I tell everybody, tell your story. They're valuable. Valuable. And priceless. They're priceless. And, amen. And I'll tell you, but, but um, 
you know, it's, it's so many great people the Lord has blessed me to have on the show that I'm humbled. I'm just so humbled. You are one of them. You're going to go into the archives um, of uh, uh, one of the um, greatest guests I've had on the show. I appreciate it. Actually, this interview <laughs> will be airing um, in a couple weeks on Comcast NBC as well. So you're going to oh, um, millions of people will be able to hear this and see this interview as well. So I'm very excited uh, about that. Um, as well. uh, so maybe, and and I, one thing that I'm not going to hold you because I, I, it's so much more we can talk about. I um, hope perhaps you will uh, come back on the show very, very soon. Anytime. Soon. All you have to do is say, Give me a date and I'll Yes, ma'am. Now now Brenda, um, where can uh fans, new people who have come in, this is this episode, be able to follow you and friend you on social media? Okay, um Brenda Lee dot com. Very good. Okay. And um Brenda, all my singers that are on my show, such as the Mel Carter, Jim Gillstrap, Charles Wright, so on and so forth. They Charles all- Wright is one of my dear friends. <laughs> they always leave me with something to remember, and I want you to pick a song that you love. But I, my audience, got to hear that beautiful voice again as we get. Okay, to I'll do that. I uh, remember this is a song, and it's been, I wrote it with Billy Osborne, and it's dedicated to everybody. It's called "Live Your Dream." <laughs> Paint your pictures, write your song, build a castle of your own, climb your mountain, climb your mountain, you can't fail the seven seas, drive your rocket ship in space, find your quiet inner place to rebuild your destiny. Whatever it may be, you know better than anyone what you want from this life. Never let someone else take your dreams away. Go for what is right for you. Only you can make your dreams come true. And wherever it takes you, I'll be by your side. You don't have to be Superman to be a hero. You don't have to be an overnight superstar. The best that you can be is good enough for me. Because all of you is all you'll ever need. So live your Go on and live your dream. You can be anything that you want to be. Live your dream. I won't sing it all. Just a taste of it. It sounds wonderful. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Is that available now? Uh huh. Is that song out and available for purchase? It's not, baby. It's not, but it's going to be. Oh, man. It's entitled Live Your Dream? Live Your Dreams. Wow. The second verse is, oh, imagine anything you can. Dare to follow your own plan. Take your life into your hands. It's Do what you believe in. Walk your own way. Do your dance. Dare to give yourself the chance in life. It'll open up for you. It's yours for the taking. Because you know better than anyone what you want from this life. Never let someone else take your dreams away. Go for what is right for you. Only you can make your dreams come true. And baby, wherever it takes you, (laughs) I'll be right there by your side. Brenda, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. You're quite welcome. You're so welcome, Brenda Ager on the Sherrard Show. We're honored. And we hope and pray that you enjoyed this episode of the show. And look, look Well, I enjoyed myself. Our... I hope they did. <laughs> I'm sure they did, Brenda. I'm sure they did. <laughs> and on our next episode of the Sherrard Show, we are going to have the iconic Holly Berry. She's going to be stopping by the show as well. 
as well as Mr. Jerry Bell from the Dad's Band. You don't want to miss this, ladies and gentlemen. Power-packed episodes on the Sherrard Show. Until the next time, we'll see you next week. Take care now.